Hello, my name is Rain, and welcome to my channel where I discuss fantasy Formula One. That Grand Prix, that entire weekend is one of the craziest we've had in a long time in F1. And this year has been a crazy year. So there are a ton of things to discuss. Let's not waste any time and get right into it. So somehow, only God knows, I've ended up at the end of that crazy weekend with a blue arrow, an arrow up. Now, granted, it is not a big one. It's basically, I'm on the same rank, but I am <laughs> I ended up with 143 points, which is one of my lowest totals of all, all throughout the year. And this was a sprint weekend, mind you. But I've ended up with a positive arrow of 166 ranks up to 10,117 from like 10,280 something. And uh, I mean, there are so many things to discuss. This could have been an amazing weekend for me. It ended up not being that. We're going to go through everything step by step. But first of all, I mean, Max Verstappen, what a, what a drive. Yes, he and both the Alpines got lucky with Colapinto's red flag. But especially Max did not put a foot wrong. And, and even Gasly and, and Ocon did not put a foot wrong that entire race. Whereas a lot of other people put a lot of feet wrong or tires wrong, I guess. So I think the entire thing of like, oh, they were just lucky. Yes, they were lucky to win it. But say Landon Norris, for example, he should have probably been P4 or at least P5 if he had been had a faultless weekend and if he was faultless if Landon Norris had drove, driven the perfect race and still ended up p4 behind those three yes that would have been unlucky for him to lose out in such a way but he ended p7 p6 after piastri let him through again so you really can't complain if you're mclaren or Landon Norris. but as a f1 fantasy player who bought in triple McLaren for this weekend, I'm going to complain because if Max Verstappen and Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon, by the way, amazing seeing both Alpines on the podium, uh, um, well, Lando underperforming severely hurt my team, Piastri underperforming severely hurt my team, and I didn't even see this until after the race had, had concluded, but because of the rain, McLaren swapped... After the sprint, McLaren swapped their rear wing out for a different one that would work better in the rain. And this really brought them back down to like in line with the rest of the field. Reminder, at the start of the weekend on Friday practice and in the sprint qualifying, the McLarens were miles ahead of everyone. No one was even close to them, both in race pace and in quality pace. And that's why the simulations on F1 Fantasy Tools so heavily heavily favored uh, mclaren like they favored him so much that even if you had a budget of a hundred million they told you to buy land on norris one of the most expensive assets in the game to 2x him and then just don't care about the rest of your team have mclaren land on norris and then whichever you could whichever assets you could afford after that that's how much the simulations favored Landon Norris, so I was perfectly fine keeping him, and I even went and bought in uh, Oscar Piastri. Now, I knew that there would be chaos. Uh, I didn't know how bad the chaos would be, but I, I suspected there would be chaos, so I did pop my autopilot. My autopilot ended up not doing anything because Landon Norris outscored Oscar Piastri, but really, like, Landon Norris could have just as easily DNF'd that race if, if uh, one of his slides would have been a bit more disastrous, something like that. And in that case, you know, my, my autopilot would have actually gone on to Sonoda, if, if Lando DNF'd, right? Because Sonoda ended up with 17 points, more than what Piastri got. But just a really disappointing result for, for most of my team. Like, none of them really scored. And you look at this team, like, thinking, your 2x driver in a sprint race scored 24 points. Piastri got outperformed by Yuki Sonoda. Franco DNF'd. Bottas got minus two points. Ferrari had a DNF as well. How did you, how did you gain a, a positive rank? Like, how did your rank not decrease? And the only reason is because so many people around my rank have Alex Albon, mainly, who DNF'd, and Hulkenberg, who not only DNF'd in the sprint, but then got disqualified for an additional minus 25 in the main race. So those of you with both of them, I'm so, so sorry. But that's just how, you know, what happens sometimes. So it's actually the high ownership of Alex Albon, mainly, but also Hulkenberg, that uh, has saved me, really. I've, I've gained rank because others have lost rank, uh, because I've not gained any points, at least not any significant points. But overall, that red flag really screwed my team, because reminder, before that, Landon Norris and George Russell were far ahead of the pack, and I do not think they would have been caught 
if if that red flag had not come out, I do still think you know there was another safety car with uh, with Carlos Sainz, so uh, Max Verstappen and the and the Alpines would have still been able to pit under a safety car. So, but they would have come out behind. They would have been on fresher tires, but it was really, really difficult to overtake with no DRS. Maybe Max could have come up and challenged them, but I do think Landon Norris would have been P1 or P2, probably P1, uh, because he overtook George when when they when they pit when they did. And additionally, Yuki Tsunoda was also one that was unlucky. Yuki Tsunoda had probably the worst moment to pit. He pitted after Lando and Russell, so after the safety car had uh, the, the virtual safety car had ended. And then immediately after that, uh, it was called as a safety car when from the track being green, and then the track was, and then the entire thing was red flagged. And reminded that Yuki Tsunoda started P3 and was running with the gas, the, the Alpines and Max. Right? It was Yuki first. It was then Ocon, and then it was uh, Leclerc, and then it was Max. Right for the, that, that, you know second quarter of the race so yuki was in front of that entire group and could have definitely finished on the podium if uh, i think he actually would have finished on the podium if uh, alpha tauri or v carb or whatever just held him for a little bit longer literally just one lap more and he would have been fine he would have been ahead of ocon right at the start and then max overtook ocon from the second restart of the sciences uh of the of the signs um after the science safety car and then would he have also been able to overtake Yuki Tsunoda maybe probably Max looked really really fast at the end but reminded he was also running in clean air there for the, the those final couple of 10 laps but he really pulled ahead of, of Ocon at the end so I think Max would have still won but I think Yuki would have been P2 or P3 had uh V-Carb just held him for one more lap and that would have obviously been a massive, massive boost. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the points that the Alpines got in because not a lot of people own them. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. But if we actually go to to this, right, and uh, and just check on, on some Alpine assets. Espan Ocon increased 1.5 million is now closer than Lance Stroll to being a B-tier asset. He got 36 points for the entire weekend. He got 8 points in the sprint then 7 points for his P4 in qualifying, and then another 21 points in the race. Absolutely monstrous. And then Pierre Gasly, almost matching him, increased 1 million, had 30 points scored. Didn't score anything in the qualifying, but got 2 points for the sprint, and then another 28 after his 10 positions gained. Almost very, very little overtakes, because, you know, he just, everyone pitted, and that's why he ended up in P3, but insane weekend for them. And I think it's really funny because I, during the deadline stream, I did my C-tier tier list for the weekend that I always do. And I said that Pierre Gasly was the second worst asset only ahead of Valtteri Bottas. And I did this entire sort of, just roll the clip. If, if, okay, so this is, if Gasly gets positive points, right? Gasly, the god, right? Gas is god, with a big, with big letters, right? If Gasly is god, and he remains P7, Despite having Behrman, Holkenberg, Albon, Lawson, Hamilton, and Perez behind him, he remains P7 and gets two points. Maybe someone cra like we, we can't we can't factor DNFs in the of the front guys into this, but even in that case, he gets two points. In qualifying, then let's say he does the same thing again. Gasly's god, he gets another four points, and then Gasly's god, he stays there. There's no way he stays there. Like, even even Gasly's god, he would go down to P8. Negative one points, force of three, maybe an overtake of two. So maybe five points, right? Gasly's god gets 11 points. So Pierre Gasly continues to jinx me over the course of the season. When I say that he is dry... <laughs> when I pit him for tip of the week and everyone should buy him, he DNFs two races in a row with the mechanical issues, uh, with technical issues. And now I say that he's the second worst C-tier asset in the game to buy, and he comes away with a 30-pointer. Which, by the way, look at his season points. That is nearly half of his season points in one single weekend utterly monstrous and those with with Gasly or Ocon I don't think Ocon is that highly owned 13% and I think that's mostly dead teams so maybe a couple of people ran Pierre Gasly but even then I think most people would have traded 
or, or swapped Pierre Gasly for someone like a Sonoda or an Alex Albon. And we do have to talk about Alex Albon. Alex Albon with this is now on a season haul of minus nine points. That is truly, truly terrible. And I know we, we look at someone like Ole Berman, who's on minus 48 points, but that's just because they introduced this new rule where an inactive driver gets DNF every time they don't race. So, you know, Ole Berman is actually on a pretty good positive score from the three races he's had. It's just that these three negatives weigh him down. Albert has not missed a race this season, and he's still on negative points. That's how many times he's DNF'd this season. He has DNF'd one, two, three, four, five, six. Is it six times? Brutal. And I've really got, been lucky not owning him for the past two races. I had him in Singapore. I did not have him in Mexico or Brazil. Uh, granted, I did have Yuki Sonoda in Mexico, and Yuki Sonoda DNF, so it didn't really matter. But I, I, I had uh, literally everyone, I feel like, had Alex Albon at the start of the season. And he just did not perform uh, three failures, really, in a row to get multiple points. And then DNF on top of that. And then I got rid of him. He scored 11 points and then 10 points. Tragic. Uh, and then I luckily did not have him for this this sort of middle spell. But the problem with Albert is that now the car looks good. I mean, Colapinto scoring fantasy points. Yes, he DNF, but he still got 10 points on a DNF, right? Uh, he ended the, the sprint with five points, qualifying no points. Uh, and then, sorry... And then he got uh, five points for overtake, so he only ended with with minus fifteen in the race for a minus ten, which is considering he DNF is isn't actually not that bad. So Colapinto is bringing in these points. Like, look at the points that Colapinto has gotten this season: eleven, nine, six, nine, eight, insane scores. And Albon has that same car and should have the possibility of doing that. But instead, he's DNF in Singapore, DNF in Mexico, DNF in Brazil. And when he's not DNF, he's getting 12 points in Azerbaijan, 11 points in Kota. So Albon has the potential to bring in a lot of points for our teams. The Williams doesn't look that bad. He's just been unlucky and making per like personal mistakes, right? That mistake that he did in qualifying in, in Brazil was all him. He would have maybe had... A, a P4, P5 start, and we saw what happened with Yuki Tsunoda, we saw what happened with Ocon, starting from those positions in the wet. Albon could have had a 17-pointer this weekend. Instead, he did not start because he wrecked his car. Again, that's like the third time he does that on his own. Yes, his DNF in Mexico isn't as bad because that was more unlucky, you know? But still, he's been really unlucky and just not bringing the points, even though he has the potential to. And what's particularly annoying about that for, for Albon owners, and me included when I had him before I sold him to Yuki Tsunoda, is that a lot of people who could not afford Albon back in the day, and what I mean back in the day was, you know, when we ran something like this, there were a lot of people who could not afford Lando Norris plus Piastri or Leclerc with Alex Albon in here, and instead had Shogun Yu when, reminder, Shogun Yu was cheaper than Valtteri Bottas. Valtteri Bottas was like 7.4 million and show was like 7.5 i don't remember exactly or maybe it was 7.3 and 7.4 it was something like that and i had shogun Yu like here in italy and i sold him before this run for valtteri bottas just because valtteri bottas was cheaper and i thought it would be better to save a bit more money so that i could final fix the people that i wanted to instead shogun Yu is just starting p20 and is literally just gaining positions in every race in every race right five points in the sprint for overtaking the astons i don't know what happened there Qualifying, always P20, and then another four points for precision's gain. Didn't do a single overtake, just ran at the back of the field. Everyone DNF to random, gained four points. Meanwhile, during this time, Valtteri Bottas has completely stunk the place out because he's so good at qualifying that he's putting the absolute dustbin of a kick sauber in like P14 and then dropping out to P18 because what's he supposed to do with that race pace, right? So Valtteri Bottas, by far the worst asset in the game, and is not even close. But Shogun Yu, by far the worst driver in F1 right now. Like, what is happening to him? Last season, I really, really rated him. I thought he was super underrated. And I thought he would go into the season actually sticking to Bottas. But he's really not. He's putting it P20 every session by, like, two seconds. And then he's just dropping off in the race. Valtteri Bottas is miles ahead of him in pace. And he's really only gaining from, like, you know, he pits and, and overtakes someone. Or people DNF around him and he's just running at the back completely you know unscathed and is now up to 8.7 million is is really remarkably catching up to alex albon he's literally 2.2 million cheaper than albon despite albon being the one that should be bringing in points and that's what's so unlucky for us albon owners we were rich 
right? Or not rich, but we had more budget so we could afford the better asset of Alex Albon. And instead, the people who had less budget who just had to go for Shogun Yu, even though they definitely did not want to at the start of this run, they have been rewarded for it, right? Whereas Albon owners have been massively, massively shafted. And I, I didn't really rate Albon for this race either, considering he started P9 in the sprint, but but another DNF is so unlucky, and he could have been on a 17-pointer had he had he just finished the lap and, and not crashed it in, in the uh, qualifying. Because, you know, reminder, he, he, he got to, to Q3, right? He... He ended seventh, and that was without doing the final run. He could have improved that for sure. Uh, it's, it's really it's one of those annoying ones, and I think now, surely his luck has to turn around. Surely his form has to turn around. And with Shogun, you only 0.2 million cheaper. You kind of have to go for Albon now. But that's what's so crazy. People have been selling Albon to Shogun Yu, and that should not be the case, but it is. And uh, that is my Alex Albon rant. We'll see if I get him or if i just avoid him for the rest of the season because uh, sh he cannot crash more i i don't re even really need to mention max Verstappen. i will just say that a 77 pointer is absolutely insane brutal and those who had him congratulations i don't feel too bad missing out on this i feel more bad like you know yuki could have had way more yuki could have been on the alpine scores lando should have been p1 or p2 piastri uh, underperformed he heavily Valtteri Bottas, if I only never sold show to Bottas, I would be on like 40 extra points by now. Those are the sort of things I'm salty about. I'm not salty about missing Max Verstappen's 77 pointer because realistically for me, for my team, there was never a chance of owning Max Verstappen for this race, especially not after the dominant performance of the McLaren. So I don't even consider that a mistake on my part. Sure, it's a mistake when you look at it uh, with hindsight, but you can't look at everything in F1 Fantasy with hindsight. You have to look at it based on what was the right choice at the time and based on the pace of the mclarens it it was the right choice it, it really was the right choice but it just didn't pan out that way but i mean i've not been massively punished mainly because of yuki Tsunoda. yuki Tsunoda really was my savior and, and i'm really really happy that i kept him uh although getting ghastly would have been uh infinitely better so what happens next we have a two week break and then we have another triple header Three more races, or I guess three more race weekends, four more races until the end of the season. It's time to look at what your end season goal is. Mine is pretty simple. If you just look below me, I'm going to finish into the top 10k. That is my goal. I want to be within four digits, right? Just get me those extra 117 places and I'll be eternally happy and content with the season. Uh, but I know a lot of you are in mini leagues either just for bragging rights or even some for money, maybe with your co-workers, with your family, with your friends. And obviously you want to win those. So really, there's no use for me now talking about what we should do with our teams. Should we keep Triple McLaren? Should we switch to Ferrari? Should we get Max Verstappen? Everything depends on the pace in Vegas, and we're getting some practice sessions in Vegas where we can actually look at things. McLaren might be back on it once the you know when it's not raining and they have their upgraded front wing that was super fast. So all of this, ignore it. The main tip that I would also consider because I'm just sitting here, I'm gonna try and play optimally, right? I'm just gonna try and follow basic th basic things, not take any super big risks, and hope I get an above average score in the last three races so that I finish inside the top 10k. But maybe you're chasing your mini league rival. I don't have that problem. If I did, if I was chasing someone in my family league, for example, that I really wanted to catch, I would play differently. And that's what I think you should do too. Because if, say we get to Vegas and McLaren look fast again, their upgraded front wing, uh, their upgraded rear wing is back and they look dominant, right? Well, if you're sitting 100 points behind your mini league rival, and they have Landon Norris, Piastri, and McLaren, it might be time to bet against them. Because as we've seen time and time again, the McLaren keep looking dominant or keep looking super competitive, and they, they just, then they just not don't perform. Either uh, Norris disappoints or Piastri disappoints or Ferrari surprises or Mercedes surprises and suddenly they're on a competitive pace, right? So it's time to take some risks. Because that's the way you catch them. You have to play differential. Now, if you're sitting at the top and defending someone who's like 50 points behind you, their job is to be differential and chase. You should play what you think is optimal, what you think is most likely to happen. If you asked me before qualifying, what do you think is the most likely thing to happen? You would have said, I would have said, 
Landon Norris wins, right? Landon Norris starting on pole. Only really George Russell behind him should have a car to challenge him. Maybe Leclerc. But Max was so far behind. No one expected Max to climb that much. I mean, I expected Max to get like P5, P6, sure. But I didn't expect him to win. And I think the vast majority of people would have said that Landon Norris would win that race if he kept it on track. He kind of kept it on track and he ended up P6. Far below any of our expectations. I mean, yes, George Russell could have popped up with a, with a win and Lando could have been P2. I could I could have definitely see, seen that happening and that's what I thought would happen when Lando lost George Russell into turn one again. But I digress. The most likely scenario was Lando Norris winning and hence I betted on Lando Norris within my F1 Fantasy team. And I think you should do the same if you're at the top of your mini leagues and you're just defending. But if you're chasing... You don't have to, like, go all out and, you know, get Haas in here and put the 2x chip on Hulkenberg. Because you see what happened when you put the 2x chip on Hulkenberg. He gets minus 45 points, and you double it to minus 90, and you destroy your season. You don't have to be that differential. You just have to be a tiny bit differential. Just, I don't know. Give it to Hamilton. Put the 2x on Hamilton. I know he didn't look fantastic, but, I mean, he got a... He got, he got 15 points, you know? Piastri got 16. And realistically, if, if Hamilton's car works better in, in Vegas, who's to say he won't put it in P2? You know? Or, I mean, George Russell, he's looking great. He got a 25-point haul. That's more than Norris got. So, these are the sort of drivers that, you know, Mercedes can definitely outscore McLaren in any given week. And I mean, even someone like a Checo, right? 26 points. Checo just needs to... If Checo qualifies badly... And then climbs like he did in 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 Brazil. That, that that's points, right? And and Checo's not getting out of Q two at the moment, so that could be a, a a fun bet. Maybe you run something like I don't know Leclerc Leclerc Checo, and then you uh, do this, and and maybe you completely bet up against McLaren, and you do uh, I don't know. Maybe you do something like this. Who knows? Like bet on bet on Red Bull and and uh, and Ferrari. Like this is obviously not optimal, but. Who's to say that Max won't crash into Lando? Well, he doesn't have to now. He just has to be ahead of him and he wins. Uh, wins the Drivers' Championship. But these are the sort of teams that you can build where, you know, it it might even be more optimal than... It, it, it might actually outscore, and, and especially if DNFs happen, right? Yes, I mean, looking at Leclerc, what, he got 26 points and Lando got 24, right? You look at Checo, Checo got 26, Lando got 24. That's that's not a big, or, you know, compare it to Piastri who got 16, that's 10 points, right? 10 points, 10 points, you're not going to catch anyone with that. The way you catch someone who's 50 or 100 points ahead of you now without any chips is that if they have drivers, the DNF, and you don't. So you just got to be different than them because you don't want to catch the same DNFs as they do. Even something like, oh, they have um, they have Franco Colapinto and Bottas because everyone has Franco Colapinto and Bottas or Franco Colapinto and Shogun Yu, right? But everyone has Franco, right? Even something like, oh, you know, go for Shogun Yu and um, keep Bottas and then go for like, I don't know. Can I afford Pierre Gasly with this? I cannot because he increased 1 million. Great. Um, I'm, I'm too poor. Okay, I'm too poor. Ignore all of these <laughs> examples, but... This, just try and have different drivers and hope, uh, different drivers than your rival and hope that your rival's drivers DNF because, I mean, the DNFs are massive and uh, I, I counted up mine yesterday and I've had a bunch this year and I've been, I've been DNF or disqualify free eight out of the 21 weekends so far. So only about a third of my races have been DNF free. Over or like over my team, both constructors and 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 drivers, and I mean the, the the DNFs is what hurts, man. And I really can't wait to look at the end of the season, especially sort of in the you know the content creators league. Some of you've heard of it. That uh, some of us uh, F1 fantasy content creators have a league where we're in. I'm I'm like eighth, by the way, but I, I can maybe climb up to fourth if I'm lucky. Actually, I'm I'm gonna show that now uh, because because it's funny. Uh, let's go to my pinned leagues and F1 Fantasy content creators, right? So th there's three people who've really pulled ahead, right? This is we're not even really close to F1 Fantasy Tools, SAC F1, and uh, Georgia. Uh, but I mean, I can maybe catch Yuan, right? Uh, F1 Fantasy pole position. He's on 4571. I'm on 4506. That's not an impossible gap if 
you know, the same thing happens where he DNS. But I'm, I'm not going to play differential just to catch <laughs> catch him in the content creator league. I'd, I'd rather try and get a top 10k finish because if, if I go differential and then I just tumble down the field. So I'm I'm kind of like at the back of this this grouped up bunch of people at, at 45 uh 4500 uh 4500 points so but what i was going to say is within this content creator league I, I would love to look at this at the end of the season and count up how many dnfs every person have because i would actually bet that georgia has the least and then it's f1 fantasy tools and then it's sack and then maybe here it's it's more even because everyone's within like 50 points of each other and then i know for a fact that f1 fantasy hub has had a, a horrid season when it comes to dnf luck so I would love to count that up at the end of the season because I do think that heavily correlates to rank, especially on the elite level. Um, and and also, you know, take a peek at, at the top 10 global leaderboard and see how how they are doing, how they are faring DNF-wise. Because I, I do think that's such a massive point of the game because those scores are so big. Like minus 20, I've said it before and I'll, I'll, I'll scream it to the moon, it is too much. They really, really need to cap the negatives in this game. Um because you get so heavily punished for something that most often is out of your control. But that's pretty much it for this video. I don't know when the next video will be, but subscribe so you do not miss it. I'll do team selection, all of that good stuff, uh, proper transfer plans when we get to the race week in Vegas. Until then, I'll probably do a... Um, end of season chip video for those of you who still have a few chips remaining with the three final remaining races when you should use what and how you should use them and uh of course early early morning uh before the qualifying in vegas that's like 5 a.m my time i will be live for live for a deadline stream but that's in two and a half weeks time so subscribe so you don't miss it follow me on twitter follow me on tiktok i'll keep posting short form content there when i feel like it and uh, I'll see you around. Thank you so much for watching this video. Goodbye.